So the question is, can we, how, how can we think systematically, if it's possible, about determining the unknotting number or determining the bridge number um, for, for knots in general? Um, so with 6-1, you got lucky in some ways um, that you found out if we just reverse that one crossing, I think the two of you did this one, yeah. uh, if we just reverse that one crossing, that that one reversal was enough um, to get us to the unknot. Uh, and so you found out that the unknotting number for 6-1 was equal to 1. Um, and so that was a lucky guess, but you can imagine that if we were to come up with an algorithm, if we were to train a computer, for example, to, to investigate for the unknotting number, one thing that we might do uh, is just look at all six crossings in this diagram and just take them one at a time, reverse that one crossing, and then do some test to see whether or not you have the unknot. And if we can get through all six of those single reversals without ever unknotting this knot, then we know that the unknotting number's got to be more than one. So there are some ways in which if we can do enough separate tests of this knot um, that we can also bracket the unknotting number from below. Um, but in fact, you know, some, of the, some of the work that was done in research in knot theory um, in the second half of the last century um, involved trying to find better algorithms for determining the unknotting number uh, for a given knot. So it's not an easy question. Um, even when you have an alternating projection, so some of the, somehow the nicest diagram, the reduced alternating projection of a knot. Um, if we can't unknot it in one crossing, then we might go up to two. And for that, so maybe you can sort of keep track over here in the, in the corner. If I wanted to test for whether or not one crossing, one crossing switch worked, then there are six different tests that I'd have to do, right? Test each of the six different crossings. Um, if I wanted to test two crossings at a time, so can I unknot a knot with changing two crossings? That means that I have to test every single pair of crossings in my diagram. Right? And if my diagram has six crossings, as this one does, that means I would have a total of six choose two, right? uh, number of combinations of six. So yeah, that's six times five over two. So that's, yeah, 15. 15 tests that I would have to do. If, if, my, if my tests of single crossings failed, um, then I could do 15 tests to perhaps rule out the unknotting number, so unknotting number being two. Right? And I could keep working my way up that way as well, um, knowing that if we got all the way up to reversing, let's see, how many crossings would I have to reverse to know for sure that I have the unknot? Um, probably six, right? If, if we could somehow reverse all, well, if I reversed all six, I would probably just get the not probably, I would definitely just get the mirror image of this knot. Um, and so we might expect um, that by the time I'm already talking about reversing four crossings, reversing four crossings in this six crossing knot is the same as reversing the other two crossings in a mirror image of this knot, right? Um, so probably by the time we get up to half the number of crossings, we've already determined everything that we need to know about the unknotting abilities of this knot. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that when you dig more into the, into the theory uh, behind unknotting number in particular, um, that you run into those, right? So, so that at least sort of shrinks the universe of checking that you have to do. Um, but even after you've shrunk in that universe, if I have a knot with a whole ton of crossings, um, there could still be a lot of different checks uh, to do. Which is another, I would say another reason that, the, that a numerical invariant like the unknotting number is a little bit clumsy to work with in a practical sense, right? You can get a lot of interesting theory out of it, but um, in a practical sense, it's kind of challenging to do. Um, the other thing that we know for sure, uh, we didn't prove this, but this was one of the theorems from last time, uh, is that if the unknotting number of a knot is equal to one, what did that tell us about the knot? Do you remember? It told me that it was a prime knot. And so it doesn't go if and only if, Unfortunately, so I wish it did, because then we could say, if the knot is prime, then for sure the unknotting number is equal to one. But at least, if this is true, call this theorem A, then what else must be true? What's the contrapositive of this theorem? So the contrapositive will say, if the conclusion of this is not true, then the hypothesis must not have been true. So if K is a composite knot, that means that the unknotting number is not equal to one. So in particular, it's gotta be greater than one, um, unless we have the unknot. Um, 
So what this can do is it can help to shrink the universe again a little bit, right? That if I'm starting with a knot that I already know is composite, that I don't have to do the checking for one crossing change. Right? I can start right away with two uh, and, and see whether or not um, two crossing changes do it. Um, so theorems like that can help to save us a little bit of time, cut a couple of corners, but it's not a huge corner cut. Uh, chances are most knots that we work with Sort of generically, most knots are not going to have one for their own crossing number, so we're going to have to do a lot of tests anyway. Um, for the bridge number, the bridge number is a little bit, uh, I think, even harder to visualize in some ways uh, because we saw an example last time. Here was an example of just the basic trefoil knot, most you know elementary, non-trivial knot that there is. Um, and determining the bridge number was really highly sensitive on the diagram that we use to, to depict the knot, right? Because we want the, all of these numerical invariants have this minimality clause in them that says that if I can draw a different diagram for the same knot, I might get a smaller answer for the bridge number. And the bridge number, or the unknotting number, or the crossing number, needs to be the smallest of all possible. Right? Um, so even, even though I may have the reduced alternating diagram, the simplest, lowest terms diagram for a knot, that diagram might not be the one that illustrates the minimality for one of these numerical invariants. So for the bridge number, um, the, the, the reduced alternating projection of the trefoil knot doesn't actually show that the bridge number is two. Right? It was three in this example, three bridges. And each bridge, remember, is an arc that has one or more uh, overcrossings, one or more uh, other strands that it crosses over. Right? And so the standard diagram for the trefoil has three bridges in it. Um, but if we can adjust the diagram in a particular way, um, we find out that we can actually do it with only two. But it's not at all obvious uh, how one would adjust a diagram to illustrate the minimality of its bridges. Um, and so there again, I think we end up falling back on some of the theorems that we know about the bridge number, which is that um, every rational knot and most of the knots in the knot catalog at the back of the book uh, are, in fact, rational knots. Um, you can tell, by the way, by looking at the Conway notation um, that's listed next to them, um, because Conway notation is in its standard form only for rational knots, right? So it only, only has positive integers in it when the knot is rational. But if the knot's not rational, then the Conway notation has other weird stuff in it, commas and asterisks and hyphens and other weird stuff that we didn't get a chance to talk about, because I'm actually not that interested in it for the purposes of our course. Um, but anyone that doesn't have that extra decoration in its Conway notation is rational. And when it's rational, we know that there is a way to show that its bridge number is equal to two. Um, and uh, that's a result that we could look into what the proof is if we wanted to, but um, I don't know that we're going to have time for that. Um, so that at least gives us a rationality um, argument. Um, and similarly, too, there's the clause about primeness. Right, that if a knot is not prime, if it's a composite knot, um, then we know how to turn the bridge numbers of the, the pieces into the bridge numbers of the composite, um, just by adding together the bridge numbers and subtracting one. Um, so, uh, so that gives us some gives us some results, but it's not there's not really much that's going to be super satisfying. On it. So, most of the time it is about you know for both for the unknotting number trying different combinations of crossing changes and trying to come up with upper bounds and lower bounds, and if eventually, hopefully, <laughs> your upper and lower bounds converge to the uncrossing number. And for the bridge number, just trying different types of diagrams um, to see if you can make fewer and fewer bridges uh, along the way. Um, and once you feel like you've gotten as far as you can, um, then if you haven't also gotten a lower bound on it, for example, by the you know, rational knot setting the bridge knot of two, um, then you kind of have to stop there. But um, yeah. One of the things I think that this illustrates is that a lot of effort over the years in knot theory has gone into computation. And we're going to get a flavor for that today. Um, if we can encode information about knots into a computer well enough, um, we can have algorithms um, trained to do the kind of searching uh, that we're sort of trying to do by hand in here today. Uh, one of the purposes of today's class is going to be to take the, the sort of hunting and searching around that we did with three colorations last time um, and turn that into an algebraic recipe uh, for how to be more systematic uh, about knowing for sure whether or not it has a three coloration, uh, whether we can actually find it by random guessing, uh, or whether we can find it in a more sophisticated way.